Bible reads in verse 1, it says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to go on unto a perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of uh, resurrection of the dead and, uh, uh, and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made uh, partakers of uh, the Holy Ghost and have tasted uh, the good word of God and the powers of the uh, world uh, to come. If they shall fall away to renew, uh, to renew them again, Unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and putting uh, put him and put him to open shame. For the earth which drinketh in of the rain that uh, cometh oft un, uh, upon it, upon it, excuse me, and bringeth uh, forth fruit meet for them uh, for them by whom it is dressed and receiveth blessing from God, but that which uh, beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing who is, uh, who whose end is to be burned but beloved we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation though we thus speak for god is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which ye have show, uh, showed toward uh, his name in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister and we, uh, we desire that every one of you show uh, the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made, uh, made promise to Abraham, because he could, he could swear by uh, no, no greater, he, uh, he swear by himself, saying, Surely a uh, blessing, I will bless thee. And multiplying, I will multi multiply thee. And so, after he had uh, patiently endured, he uh, obtained the promise. For uh, for men verily swear by the greater, and an oath uh, for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto uh, the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, con uh, confirmed it by an oath that two immutable things in which it was, uh, it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, uh, who have fled from refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which uh, hope we have an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and, uh, and which, endure, uh, which entereth into that wherein the veil. Whether the forerunner is for us, entered, even Jesus, made uh, a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, that you would uh, speak uh, you know, truth tonight. Lord, that the seed of your word will find fertile soil upon our hearts. Lord, wait, may we not um, go off of Maybe things that, that were uh, falsely taught, but Lord, the truth of your word. And Lord, may we, God, always seek to know your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. As you guys know that, you know, I've been preaching through the book of Hebrews for several weeks. And in, in Hebrews chapter 5, the Apostle Paul contrasts those who are spiritual babies of feeding only on the milk of, of the word of God and those who are... Uh, who go on to maturity, feeding on the meat of God's word. He continues uh, this line of reasoning in uh, Hebrews chapter 6. Tonight, I want to speak to you on behalf of some landmarks, specifically spiritual landmarks. The thing is, is that one of the things I won't, uh, I'm not going to talk about, I'll talk about this you know, next time or next Wednesday, is I'm going to talk about uh, Jesus and Melchizedek and how, um, how they line up as well. Uh, so for that part, I won't uh, go into that. But spiritual landmarks define boundaries. I mean, you think about landmarks. I mean, landmarks can be anywhere from the fact of like Mount Rushmore as being a landmark, right? Or the fact that there's a, a broken sign next to a tree down the way and you got to turn right in order to make a turn, right? When you go on directions, right? Those landmarks that you find. And that's, that's actually the way that I know things better than following street signs. 
If somebody tells me, hey, there's something over here, you know, a, a dead tree that's over here, it looks like a you know, shepherd's crook that died or whatever, I know that as opposed to First Street. I, I know landmarks by the things that, that I see, but in these spiritual landmarks, like I said, they define boundaries and they're points of reference, obviously, right? Of how you, uh, how you get someplace and how you, how you go, for, uh, you know, for, you know, and this is how all of our doctrines are measured with the Bible being obviously our benchmark is that we have certain landmarks in the Bible that tell us what we need to believe, right? And the boundaries and those points of reference. I mean, we are not, uh, we are not as many who corrupt the Word of God by making it conform to our own doctrine, but we are those few who continually mold our doctrines to the Word of God. We don't sit there and, and change God's word just so it fits our doctrine, right? We say, you know what, this isn't God's word, we're going to change our doctrines. If God's word says it, we believe that, as opposed to what somebody else tells us. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, sorry, yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but, uh, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. So we, even at this time, even at the time of the Apostle Paul, there were people already corrupting the Word of God. You, you know this verse, you know, before when I've talked about, you know, the fact of different, uh, the different Bibles out there and everything else, people think that, that uh, you know, that nobody is corrupting the Bible at all, right? That nobody ever, you know, touches it, they just leave it alone, that Jehovah's Witnesses have the right Bible, the Mormons have the right Bible, that nobody ever messes with the, uh, the, with the Bible, right? But Paul says even uh, during his time, People were corrupting the Word of God. They wanted to change what it says, right? So this evening, I want to look at what I'm calling the landmark of salvation. The landmark of salvation. This is a very important subject. Why? Because if you don't have salvation right, you, it doesn't matter if you get anything else right. If you're not saved, you're not on your way to heaven, you're going to hell, it doesn't matter if you have every other doctrine right. If you don't have salvation right, there's, there's really no point in you getting those other doctrines right until you get salvation right. Right? Right? So this may you know, sound a little strange uh, to many as, you know, obviously some people you know, will look at it and say, well, we, you, we live in the belt buckle of the Bible belt. People will look at that, they'll say, you know what, you guys are like the belt buckle, everything is, you know, the entire country, you know, there's churches all over the country, both in cities and also in rural areas. And as you guys mostly, you know, mother, there's nearly uh, 20 churches in Corollasville alone. There's actually, uh, according to the website, there's actually 18 in, in Carlesville alone. So on every country road, at every stop sign, you'll find some sort of church sign or in different directions. If you look down any road, you're probably going to find a church, right? This is America for, you know, you know, for a reason, right? Everybody you know, sees it. Whether that church is still open or not, you'll find a church. Yet most people here in Carlesville do not know how to get to heaven. That's a sad reality, that there are people in, in Corellasville that with, all, with the 18 churches in Corellasville, that they, uh, there are people that still don't know how to get to heaven. I mean, I've, I, I myself and others have went door to door, and we've talked to people that go to church, that have went to church for you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and had no idea if they were saved or not. How, you say, how is that possible? How is that possible? And the reason why I say this is because many of them go to churches who preach a perverted form of the gospel, a perverted form of salvation that will not save them. Paul spoke of this perversion, as I just read in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He also you know, spoke of this perversion in Galatians chapter 1 and also in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 through 4. It says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you uh, to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh uh, preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if uh, you have received another spirit, which ye, uh, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye are not accept, uh, accepted, ye might well bear with him. I think oftentimes most people sit there and think, well, this other Jesus is very easy to see. 
This, this verse, these verses right here tell you that Satan uses subtlety to get into churches. It's not as easy as going, well, that's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's a false gospel. Or that's Jehovah's Witnesses. That's a false gospel. Or you know, this, 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 and this. He's, yes, that's very easy to see. People see it. But the thing is, there are still people blinded by that false gospel. And there are people in churches all around that, are, that, are, uh, you know, that think that their church is, is preaching to them a correct gospel, and they're actually perverting the gospel. Why? Because they don't actually read what God's Word says. They read what other people write about God's Word and think that they're right. This is why we talked about before about this spiritual meat and, 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 and spiritual milk is the fact that oftentimes when people uh, go out, they buy a Bible, they want a Bible that has study notes in it, or they want to go out and buy a brand new devotional. The only thing is that you're getting is their opinion on what they think that God's Word is saying. You're not getting what God's word wants to say to you. And so when we look at this, he's going to do, uh, uh, it says that Satan, or the, you know, the serpent, beguiled Eve through subtlety so that your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. A salvation that is by grace through faith alone with no mixture of personal merit or good works, that's what I'm preaching tonight, is that salvation is by grace through faith and nothing else, that's the gospel. Not the fact of good works, you know, that you have to keep maintaining good works to be saved, or you gotta, uh, uh, that you have to do good works to remain saved. Because you know what that sounds like? It sounds like every other religion in the world besides Christianity. Every other uh, uh, cult, every other false religion, every other uh, one out there, teaches a works-based salvation that you've got to keep doing good works. I mean, the Muslims are, are, are the same. The Muslims teach this, that basically when they die and go to hell, they're falling into a pit, and God is weighing out their good works and their bad works, and hopefully their good works outweighs their bad works, because then, you know, if, if that does, then God will save them right before he falls into hell and bring them up into paradise. You have already, uh, I mean, there's, there's other there's other, there's other Christian denominations that say that you must maintain, uh, you must, you know, the only way you can maintain salvation is by your good works. That you have to be holy. You have to remain holy. The problem is, is that we still sin in this body, right? in this body, don't we? And so it's impossible. I mean, it was along the lines that when I was newly saved, that I had a, a friend of mine who asked me, he said, so you tell me this, do you lose your salvation, say you get into a car accident, but right before you get into that car accident, you say a bad word, and then you get in that accident and you die, where do you go? And I had to sit there and think about it because, you know, what I was taught was basically if I I'd said a bad word or whatever, that means all of a sudden I lost my salvation and I was going to go to hell. That doesn't really seem like eternal salvation, does it? Like salvation is eternal, that you you know, that it does not go away. But the fact is, is that you know, like I say, many teach a a salvation that that cannot secure, but only can place one on probation. If if a person believes that, if a person believes that one simple act of disobedience or one sinful act of of sin, that you lose it, that means that you're on probation, you're not even saved. Because you're hoping that all the way up until the end, even if you stub your toe and then fall on a knife or something like that, that all of a sudden you're like, you didn't say a bad word, you kept it in your mouth. But there's a problem with that because the Bible says that the thought of foolishness is sin. So just because you didn't say it, you might have thought it. And say, well, Pastor, why are you, t- you, know, why are you, you talking about this? Because the thing is, is that I want us to realize that these people that teach us works-based salvation, that you've got to continue in holiness, that you've got to continue to do good works and everything else, they're being dishonest. They're lying. If I remotely had the thought, you know, that a person could be saved, uh, sorry, that a person could be lost after that they were saved, when I witnessed to somebody, I would have to tell them this. I would have to, you know, say that, okay, well, you're saved, but there's still, a possibility, uh, there's still a possibility that you could be lost and go into hell. Is that really hope? Because the entire, 
if you, uh, as I was reading Hebrews chapter 6, the entire chapter in Hebrews 6 is about hope. It's about giving you hope. That's not no hope. I mean, you know, to me it's like, okay, well, you're saved, but you might not be, and you might still go to hell. In the Bible Belt, Christianity is the best hidden truth in the Bible. No one, I mean, think about this. I, I, you know, think about it for yourself. No one ever witnesses to me. I have yet to have somebody come to my door and actually try to get me saved. Have you? Nobody hands me, you know, not even hands me a gospel track. Nobody invites you know, me to church and I say, well, you're the pastor. That's beside the point. Not everybody in town knows that I'm a pastor and where I live. You say, well, most of them. I say, well, you, but nobody ever comes by. I'm going to ask you, like, how many of you received the gospel this week from somebody else in this county? Somebody that knocked on your door and actually gave you the gospel without you having to say, well, I'm already saved. Has anyone? I mean, there are so many people who do not have the full assurance of the salvation. The problem is ignorance of what the Bible teaches and the fact of they couple, you know, uh, they couple what the Bible teaches with the fact of them teaching or, or them learning self-merit. I deserve this. People actually get saved, and then, because they still have an old nature to go along with their new nature, doubt, some doubt their salvation because they still sin. I mean, you know, I've said it before, there's more days, you know, than not that where I don't feel saved than when I do feel saved. And there are some people out there who say, well, then if you don't feel like you're saved, that means you're not saved. Since when does the Bible tell you that you are to trust your feelings? As the song says, feelings, nothing more than feelings. Uh, your feelings, your emotions, all those things, when you take into account, do what? Your emotions change, right? Whether or not you feel saved, whether or not you, you don't feel saved. So this, easy, this evening, my message will be simple. And you say, well, Pastor, I don't know, right now it doesn't seem all that simple. But because the reason why it's going to be simple is because salvation is simple. People have made it way too difficult to get saved. And that's not how the Lord Jesus made it to be. He made it to be simple. You say, well, no, he didn't. Then why did he say that, you know, it takes the faith of a child to enter the uh, kingdom of God? You're going to tell me that a child is going to, you know, uh, going to go back and try to remember all the sins that they've ever committed, all the times they maybe talked back to their mom or their dad, or they're going to have to repent of all their sins and do all this other junk? I mean, a child is what? They're innocent. They believe everything that you say, don't they? Until proven wrong. That's why for me, that's why I say it, because when I don't believe, you know, that our sound person, you know, believes in Santa Claus anymore. She gave me a thumbs up. That's why we don't tell our daughter and won't tell, you know, any uh, future kids that we have to believe in Santa Claus. Because oftentimes, and you say, well, that's not fun. You know, it's just a you know, fun make-believe. But think about it. They've never seen Santa Claus. They've never seen him come down the you know, chimney. They've never seen any of those kind of things happen. And you're told to believe him. And then one day you say, you know what? I, I, I was just playing. I was just making believe. It's a lie. They can equate that with God. Because why? They don't see him. They don't see how he's working. They don't see you know, all these things. And yet you tell them that he's real. And you can destroy a faith of a child by sitting there saying, on one side, saying, you know, that this person over here was just make-believe. Well, they're going to believe Jesus is make-believe. You say, well, Pastor, that's a little bit too far. I just want to, you do whatever you want to do in your own house. But that's the way that we, you know, that's the way we are over the, in the Harding household is that we don't do it just because um, I remember I was devastated when my parents told me because my brother was teasing me saying, you still believe in Santa Claus? You still believe in Santa? You know, and making fun of me. And that's so why I went to my parents and asked, 
And they said, well, no, he actually doesn't. Now think about it, you know, along those lines, you know, all that faith that they, play, uh, they placed in Santa Claus, and then you go over and say, well, Jesus, you know, gives you a free gift of eternal life. You can't see him, but he's there. He died for you. All There's waiting for you to, uh, you know, the day for you to come up to him and say, oh, no, I was just blamed. It was just make-believe. There's no God that really loves you. There's no God that saved you. You're all going to go to hell anyways. But think about this. The Bible says what? Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Our Lord said that the only way to, uh, to heaven is through the new birth. Right? That we must be born again. And the, on these last days, the new birth is looked down upon, and its recipients are maligned and, and mocked. The landmark of salvation is still repentance is what? Is turning what? Away from, you know, uh, turn away from this life and turning towards Christ, right? And faith. So now let's, let me look at, you know, let's, let's define some of these terms. Like I said, repentance is a turning or a changing of your mind. That's how the Bible describes it. We were just talking to a lady on uh, this past Sunday who, you know, who said that you had to repent of all your sins in order to be saved. And I said, well, really? I said, we have to repent of all of our sins? I said, did God have to repent of sin? And the person looked at me you know, like I was nuts. And they said, well, no. Why would God have to repent? And I said, well, I said, the only reason why I ask is because in the Old Testament, God repents more than anybody else. I said, it does not mean repent of your sins. When is the word, you know, it, when it says repent, it means either, you, you know, you're changing or you're, 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 it's a change of mind. So what did God do? He repented. He changed his mind in the Old Testament. Now, it is a good thing, obviously, to, to turn away from sin, but that's the from sin part has been you know, added on you know, by a lot of like, modern scholars that want to say that they know more than what the Word of God actually teaches. And actually, the, the denomination, the false, teach, you know, the false uh, religion of the false, uh, you know, cult, if you want to call it, is Mormonism that teaches that you must turn from all of your sins in order to be saved. But they also go on further and make it even worse and say, and as you, you, know, keep, you, repent, or you keep repenting or turning away from your sins, you know, as they define it, your skin becomes whiter. So let's look at this. Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Therefore, leaving the principles of, of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, now laying again the foundation of repentance from, uh, from dead works and of faith toward God. The context, obviously, of this verse is actually found in the previous chapter, in chapter 5. One, uh, this is one of chapter. Uh, this is one of five uh, warning sections that the, the book of Hebrews has was in uh, it was in chapter five. So let's look at chapter five, verse eleven, and then we'll go through uh, through verse one. So chapter five, verse eleven says, "Of whom we have many things to say, and hard uh, to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when, for the time, uh, ought ye uh, ought ye to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again." which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of, of use, having their uh, senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Verse 1 of chapter 6, Therefore... Leaving the principles of the doctrines of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. And so, obviously, when we read this, these verses are not, you know, these verses are not written to the unsaved, but to those who are saved, who refuse to pl uh, put their self, uh, plant their salvation in the Word of God and, uh, into, and into Jesus Christ, that they are not wanting to go on to spiritual growth. Just so you know, when it has a chapter on there, there those were not originally in the Bible. Those were added later. The chapters and the verse numbers were added later. Those are not originally in the Bible. So when, when you're reading this, you didn't go, oh, wait, it's a different, you know, it's a different chapter. We, you know, we just separate it. No, we don't separate it. It's all one letter, right? 
And so that's what we need to realize, that that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about, is the fact you know, that we need to keep going on you know, through this. And the fact is, is that if you're saved but you doubt your salvation, you will never be fully functionable or usable. The Bible wants us to get it settled and get it settled in the Bible, not in your feelings or your emotion. God wants you to be settled upon his word and what his word says. Right? He does not want you, you know, uh, to be off on the, on the spiritual milk for the rest of your life as a believer. He wants you to grow up to maturity. And just because, and I, I say this because I have gray hair, just because a person has gray hair does not mean that they are mature in Christ. Like I said, I've met, I've, uh, I've met believers that were in their 20s, but they're, you know, they're of full age, as it describes here, that they've been studying you know, the Word of God. They're, they're on the strong meat of what God's Word says. And other ones that are, you know, I've met other ones that are in their 70s and 80s, they're still on the milk, and they've been in, you know, in church for 40, 50 years. Right? So in, in chapter 5, verse 12, where it says, Ye have need that one teach you again, which... Be the first uh, principles of the oracles of God. What is an oracle? What is or- our oracles? Simply, it means an utterance of what God had said. Jesus, you know, uh, spoke a, a pure gospel on how to be saved in what John chapter th- uh, John chapter three, when he says, "You must be born again." The principles means that it's the foundation or the fundamental, uh, or it's a fundamental with the phrase using. Uh, a definite article, I'm going to take you back to school for a little bit, it has a definite article, the, which means one and only one of kind. So the principles, you know, a, a precedent that is being set, right? That is set in place by, by the word of God. Then it goes on to, the next, you know, uh, part I want to divine for you is first. What does first mean? First. First means First. Coming before all others in time or order, earliest is the first thing. It, it establishes the salvation as the one and only first step for the unsaved. There's one step to getting saved, and that is salvation, right? You believing on the Lord Jesus Christ by grace through faith, right? These saved believers chose to remain willfully ignorant, as they were taught again and again the truth of salvation coupled with the, bless, uh, with the blessed assurance. So they kept on not wanting to listen to what the pastor was saying every single week and everything else. They wanted to stay willfully ignorant or the fact that they got saved and they didn't want to go to church and grow. That they wanted to stay home and say, I'm saved, I'm good, I don't have to do anything else. I'm just going to sit back and relax and do whatever I want to do. That's not the right attitude to have. God wants us to go on to maturity. That's why he's pushing them towards hope, right? He wants to, you know, push them. The hope is, is that everyone will be mature. Again, in chapter 6, verse 1, it says, we find these words, therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. The word therefore shows a continuation of context as chapter 6 is tied to, to, to chapter 5, right? So the therefore is to is a continuation of thought that we were just talking about in verses 11 through, uh, 11 through 14, correct? That's what the therefore is there for. <laughs> Leaving means what? To walk on, to move forward, to not remain spiritual doubter, doubters. He's saying, you know what? He's, not, he, he's, he's saying leaving those things. He's not saying like forget about them, but he's saying, you know what? Okay, you understand that. Let's move on. Let's go forward. Let's understand more about God's word. Let's understand more about Jesus Christ. It says, you know, principles, you know, that we have explained that that's the first, that salvation is the first fundamental truth that we need to understand. We need to get it settled and then move on. We need to figure out what does it mean to be saved? How do you get saved? Is it you have to ask yourself, does the Bible teach a works-based salvation of saying that you must do, you must repent of every single one of your sins that you've ever done in your life and you're never, gonna re, you're never going to sin ever again because if you're going to repent of every sin, you have to also do the future ones too, don't you? That you, uh, that, you know, does the Bible teach that? Does the Bible teach that you keep your salvation by doing good works? Does the Bible teach you all these things? If you say no, which is the correct response, 
You say, no, I'm saved by grace through faith. I have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ for what he did upon the cross. That that was enough to save me. That's that fundamental truth. And you say, you know what? And that, that what he did on the cross can save me. And if I believe that, then I'm saved. That I'm trusting Christ to save me. He's saying, okay, do you understand that? Settle it and then move on to the other things in life. Not saying that you forget about your, your salvation or you forget what God has done for you, but he's saying, you know what? I want you to go on to understand more about what, uh, you know, what I want you to do in this life or how I want you to act in this life, how I want you to behave in this life. You know, you, should you, you, know, uh, you know, cheat you know, on your taxes or should you go do this or should you whatever? You know, should you, should you, uh, you know, okay, well, I'm going to stop you know, smoking. I'm going to go on to vaping. Should I do these things? That's what he wants you to do. He's like, you know what? I want you, you know, to realize, okay, you're saved. You're settled on that. You're good. Now you got to find out what God's word says about all these other issues. That's what he wants you to do. And it says of the, the doctrine. That, that means, you know, a topic or, you know, a treatise, a an utterance or a word or a work, a belief or a set of beliefs held and taught by the Bible. Doctrine is a good thing. Oftentimes I have actually even heard people say, well, I don't want to know all that doctrinal stuff. I don't want to know that whatever. I just want to love Jesus. If you don't know what doctrines the Bible teaches, in which the word doctrine literally means teaching, if you don't love the doctrines of Christ, then how can you... Uh, I mean, you say, I just want to love them. You can't love them if you don't know them. If you don't know those doctrines, then how are you going to know, you know, love them you know, for those things? I just want to love on them. Well, then anybody can come up to you and just tell you any wind of doctrine, and you're going to go on and believe it. Because all I want to do is just love on Jesus. That's it. I don't want any of that doctrines because doctrines split. Well, you know what? I, uh, you know, I'm going to be the bearer of bad news to you. What did God's word say that, you know, that he was going to do? That he had come to divide Jesus Christ did not say that he was going to unify every single church out there, but he was, that his doctrine was going to divide families. That it was going to divide you, know, the world, you, know, you from the world. That's one of the reasons why I can never say that I'm ecumenical. You say, what's ecumenical? Where we have this belief, just because you name the name of Christ, that means you're saved and that you're a Christian and that we should all get along together. Not every single church out there believes you know, salvation correctly, so why would I align myself with them? Right? Unless I'm going to that church you know, you know, to try and witness to them to get them saved. One of the last part it says, it says, of Christ. Obviously, this is a foundational, this is one of the fundamentals of the faith that's dealing with salvation. Who were we saved by? Christ. We are, in, we are saved by Christ, the incarnate word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we're saved by. The latter part of chapter 6, verse 1 says this. It says, leaving the principles, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of, of faith toward God. Let it, so that part where it says, let us go on unto perfection, that means spiritual maturity. That means completeness. That does not mean sinless perfection. Because we will always, in this life, live in a sinful body and fail God. What was, what was, born, again at, uh, what was born, uh, born again that brought you salvation? Your spirit. That's why Jesus even makes the comment, you know, uh, you know, for him was that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Obviously, he was perfect, but he knows, he knows the frailty of this body. He knows this, this body is going to let you down. But that's why the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7 that why do I do the things that I don't want to do and the things I do want to do, I don't do. Because this body is going to sin. But it's your spirit that is saved. Then you go on to heaven and then you get what? A glorified body. In other words, what he's saying is, get your salvation settled. 
and grow up. Says, uh, he goes on to say, not laying again the foundation, which means to repeatedly try to get saved over and over again. This is actually settled, and the, the, the thing is, is, I'm going to read these verses, and oftentimes these verses have been used to show, and people say, well, see, right there, it says that you can lose salvation. Look at verse 4, and we're going to go through uh, verse 6. And they use these ones, and they'll say it. But what the funny thing is, is that it actually ironically says the exact opposite of what they're trying to teach. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have taste, uh, tasted of the, holy, uh, the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the, uh, the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and to put him into open shame. To an open shame. And they'll sit there and say, see right there, it says, that it says if they fall away. That means that they can whatever. But they don't go on to the next part of it. It says, to renew them again unto repentance. It says, seeing that they crucify... He's making a, a point here saying, you know what, every time, you know, that a person, every time that they were supposedly getting saved over and over and over again, they're crucifying Christ over and over again. But what does it say in verse 4? For it is impossible for those who have once, who are, who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the word of God. So he's, what is he telling us? It is impossible that once you were saved that you would lose it. That's the hope he's bringing right there. Because what does he say? He says that, you know, that was impossible. He says you know, uh, that if they should fall away to renew the gift under, uh, unto repentance. Well, we know that Jesus Christ is not being crucified over and over again by a person getting saved. That's why at the Catholic Church, it's, it's really strange. Where's Jesus at in the Catholic Church? He's still on the cross. Did you ever notice that? You go into a Catholic hospital... Big, big thing, you know, bigger thing on the cross. And who's still on the cross? Jesus. He is not on the cross anymore. He's been raised, you know, he's been raised from the dead. Why? Giving us new life. But with this right here, it says that it's impossible for us, you know, for those, you know, that have tasted, you know, that, that basically have partaked or have partook of salvation. It is impossible for us to be renewed again. Why? Because you can't lose it. It's impossible to. And the very verse that they use, because they take one little, you know, one little section that says, oh, if they f shall fall away. That's not what he's teaching there. We've got to read the whole. Remember we're talking about context? Read the verses before, read the verses after, read all those things. You know. It's one of those things that, you know, like I said, I didn't read the rest of it. It says, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Saying, uh, saying that if that were possible, it, that, if, you know, that if you can lose it, that you would have to crucify Jesus all over again. And then again, and then again, and then and again, and again. But Jesus, as you're going to find out, in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, I, who I believe is the Apostle Paul, says that his sacrifice was once and for all. That his death was good enough to save all of mankind if they so choose, so, so chose. Does that make sense? Jesus, like I said, died once and for all, and he will never be re-crucified. He is not perpetually hanging on the cross. He is, uh, he is the resurrected and ascended Savior. Now let's look at that word again, uh, your principles. The, uh, the word is, in this form is, is, is plural as the foundation of, of salvation through Christ. Uh, uh, Christ alone is found multiple uh, principles which are given in these things. It says the foundation of what? Repentance or turning from dead works and faith in God or faith toward God. So I want to look at these two principles that make up the foundation uh, which are, 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 which are salvation is established. The first one, repentance from dead works or turning from dead works. Romans chapter 3, verse 28 says, Therefore, 
we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So like for those uh, Hebrew Roots Movement and all the Judaizers that are out there that say you've got to keep every single one of your commandment, uh, those are works. And the Apostle Paul, this is, this is a, a funny thing. If you ever meet a Hebrew Roots person, and I've met a couple here in town, They'll tell you you got to keep you got to keep the law one hundred percent. You got to go. Do you know the one person that they hate in the Bible is Paul. They say Paul, you know, uh, you know that his writings should have been you know not included at all in the New Testament. You know why? Because he makes statements like that. It says, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Because we can't keep all the law. Because the Bible says that if we offend at one point, we are guilty of it all. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by, faith, by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, but it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Let's look at the second part of that, of, uh, of that principle that he talked about. Faith towards God. That's a direction. That, you know, toward is a direction, right? Salvation is an act of God, not of man. Salvation is all God. It's all him. John chapter 14, verse 6 says, Jesus saith unto them, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I have preached unto you, which also ye have received, wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. Here, no, he says, ye are saved. It's not a process. It's not the fact that you are being saved. You are saved. If ye keep in memory uh, what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, for I believe, uh, for I delivered unto you First of all, that which I also received, how that uh, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the, rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The God, that's the gospel right there. Let's look at biblical salvation. It's a singular salvation. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25 says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Man always tries to fix things that are not broken. That includes the Word of God. That includes, you know, the church. That includes the Bible, right? Isaiah chapter 43, verse 11 says, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. It's a singular salvation. Meaning the fact is, is that there's only one way to heaven. There's not multiple ways to get in. Acts chapter or four verse twelve says, "Neither is there any self, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven among given among men whereby we must be saved." John chapter ten verse nine says, "I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be what saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture." John chapter fourteen verse six we just read it, but I'm gonna read it again. Jesus uh, uh, saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no man come unto the Father but by me. Biblical salvation is an eternal salvation. It does not end. Once you're saved, it does not end. You have salvation. You have e you know, eternal life at that very moment. John chapter 10, verse 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall what? Never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I've heard people say, well, you know, no man can pluck them out of my hand, but if I wanted to, I can get out of it. I'm like, what are you, an alien? What does it say? It says, no man 
is able to. You're not stronger than God. Why, you know, if you're saved, people should understand if you're saved, why would you want to get out of the Father's hand? Why would you want to get out of his, you know, out of his protection? John chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so uh, must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting, everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. John chapter 5, verse 24 says this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believe on him that sent me, what? Hath everlasting life. That is present tense. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from what? Death unto life. Romans chapter 8, verse 35 through 39, you're going, Pastor, you got an awful lot of scripture. Why? Because the scripture still speaks. It's alive, ain't it? John, uh, sorry, Romans chapter 8, verse 35 through 39 says this, Who shall separate us from the, love of God, uh, from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are all killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What can separate you from the love of Christ? Nothing. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, uh, who, which accordingly, <clears throat> according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. It's reserved for you. That's why he says, you know what, I go prepare a place for you. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready, or ready to be revealed in the last time. That salvation, it's a life-changing salvation. It changes you, doesn't it? You pass from death unto life, don't you? Acts chapter 20, verse 21 says this, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, repentance showing there that, it's, that you're turning towards Christ, right? And putting your faith in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation or new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. God doesn't hold your previous life against you. The blood covers that. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ, uh, Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. He wants us to walk in those good works. That does not mean that we get saved by them. He wants to do it. Why? Because he wants other people to see the goodness of God and that they would come to Christ through our lives. God chooses to use us to reach other people. I mean, think about that for a second. He chooses us to reach other people for him. You say, man, that's pretty messed up. Because he uses a flawed messed up person like myself, and says, I want you to go tell them about a perfect God, a holy God, a loving God. If Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, and we're, we're talking about this because it's mission's emphasis, and this is the verse that we use. It says, let your light so, uh, so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The salvation, it's available to all. It's not just for a select view like the Calvinists teach. Salvation is available to all. Luke chapter 24, verse 47 says, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among how many nations? 
all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Romans chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. For there is no difference between Jew or, or, or the Greek, for, there, uh, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 2 Peter chapter uh, 3, verse 9. I see pens back there smoking back there, so that means you know they, they must be catching all the words that I'm writing. I know I saw it. I saw smoke coming up. Second Peter. I saw smoke coming from your pad of paper. She's going through it. The Lord is. There you go. Second Peter chapter three verse nine says this: the, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering to usward not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, or in other words, all should turn to Christ. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's a, gra uh, it's a gracious salvation. Salva uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5 says, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. Titus chapter 3, verse 5 through 7. Not by, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Christ Jesus our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I love that first, you know, that first verse that, you know, that I read in verse 5. It says, for by, uh, for, not by works, of righteousness which we have done because our righteousness is what but a filthy rags it says but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing a regeneration the renewing of the holy of the holy ghost it's not by it's not about us it's never been about our righteousness or keeping the law or keeping good works or keeping all these things in order to keep salvation. The Bible says what? That was because according to his mercy that he saved us. That it is by grace through faith that he saved us and that he still saves today. The landmark of salvation has, has been removed in many a church today and the result is confusion. So many people have no idea how they are uh, to get saved. As I mentioned earlier, we go out, we'll go knock door to door. A person will have been going to church for decades and yet have no idea how to get saved or whether they're saved or not. People rely upon everything else other than the finished work of Jesus Christ, that what he did upon that cross was enough to save every single person, not only in this room, not only in this city, not only in this county, not only in this country, not only in this hemisphere, but across the whole entire world, that God saves people, and he's still saving people today. But the thing is, is that we can't be confused by, uh, by what salvation is and isn't. We got to know what it is that we are saved by grace through faith. And this is not of ourselves, right? Lest any man should boast, but it is a gift of God. His death according to the scripture, his death, his burial, and resurrection according to the scripture, there is no other way to heaven but by Jesus Christ and believing upon him. As it says in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, it says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. You can't get much plainer than that. And so the Apostle Paul, when he's writing this letter to the Hebrews, he is telling them, you need to move on from this. You need to understand it. You be gracious and grateful for it. Don't ever forget you know, from the height from which you have fallen. But he, I want you to move on to the spiritual meat of God's word. 
I mean, Peter himself, when he wrote, I believe it was in Second Peter, he wrote about that, uh, that there are people uh, trying to misconstrue what the Apostle Paul was, say, uh, was saying. They were saying that it was too f- uh, far above and, you know, uh, their understanding. And that's why I believe that Hebrews is, is one of Paul's writing, uh, apart from the fact he also mentions Timothy, and Timothy is one of his disciples, one of the ones that he built up in the faith and became a pastor in Ephesus. Romans chapter uh, 10, verse 9, and I I conclude with this. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt uh, believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It doesn't get any plainer than these verses tonight. You know, and the fact is, is, you know, of having to go uh, through all those verses and I went through them quickly because I noticed the time was getting away from me. But the thing is, is that the landmark, we need to understand that. We need to believe salvation. We need to be settled on what God's word says about salvation and then go on into spiritual maturity. That's what the Apostle Paul is imploring to us. Because as we get in to, uh, further into Hebrews, you're going to see that it's going to get a lot deeper. And for some of it, might go over your head. But if we, if we, if we commit ourselves to, you know, uh, to the reading of God's word and to spiritual maturity and say, I want to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord, then we may not understand it now, but eventually we will understand it as we go.